Hello, and welcome to Best Practices for Sector Initiatives, Partnering Effectively. We're so glad that you could join us for today's webinar. My name is Jim Torrens of the Insights Center for Community Economic Development and the National Network of Sector Partners, or NSP, initiative. And I'll be your moderator today. NNSP is the National Association for Sector Initiatives, uh, regional industry-focused workforce partnerships, and their supporters. And uh, if you'd like more information about sector initiatives or about NNSP, you can visit us online at www.nnsp.org, uh, including signing up for our free updates. I'm joined in our offices here in Oakland today by Laverne Gardner, who is our office manager, who's providing technical support. So Laverne, thank you for, for helping out. Um, I want to also say that this webinar is made possible by a grant from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, um, which has been a long supporter of sector initiatives and the sector movement. How to partner effectively is a topic that's of crucial importance for sector initiatives and that we heard in surveys uh, leading up to this webinar was one of the topics that sector initiatives, particularly in the Mid-South where we're doing some targeted work, wanted to uh, increase their effectiveness on. And we're lucky to have with us today an, a, a truly model partnership that uh, will allow us to explore what it takes to be effective in combining the resources and capacities of different organizations. Um, Training Futures is an initiative of Northern Virginia Family Services and Northern Virginia Community College, which I'm going to refer to as NOVA from now on because I think that's what, what you all do. Um, and uh, we have with us Susan Craver, who's a training coordinator at Training Futures and is one of the co-founders of the Training Futures Initiative uh, and uh, can, there, uh, can help shed light on how the project has developed and grown over time and as well as what it does on the ground. Susan, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Also, we have Bill Browning. Uh, Bill is a special assistant to the president for work, uh, the president of NOVA for workforce initiatives. And Bill, I think you've also been with the partnership for as long as it's been a partnership. Is that is that right? That's correct. Been here for the long haul. Right. Well, we, I think. Uh, Sustaining a partnership uh, is aided by such continuity. Um, I want to also acknowledge that Bill is a member of NNSP's National Advisory Committee. So, Bill, thanks for being on the webinar today. Great to be here, Jim. We also have from Northern Virginia Community College, Bill Kasanovich. And Bill is the Director of Community-Based Co-Enrollment Programs. Um, Bill is going to be able to talk about how NOVA has uh, not only uh, expanded, but also built upon and, and replicated the partnership with uh, Training Futures. And we'll talk about how the partnership is working today. So, Bill, thanks so much for, for being on the webinar, too. Welcome, Jim. Uh, let me add the word here that Bill Browning and I are often in the same uh, environment, and so if people have particular questions, it's Bill B and Bill K, and that makes things a little simpler. <laughs> yes, two bills. Um, well, I'll 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 do my best to to distinguish, and you all can sort it out if I if I fail to do so. Sure. Um, so I just want to go through a few logistics. Uh, you can use the arrow in the upper left of your control panel to shrink and expand it, get it out of your way. Um, there are two ways to listen today, and if you can hear me now, you are using one of them. Um, you are in listen-only mode and will remain so, but we do want your questions. And uh, you can submit those through the questions pane of the control panel. And I really recommend that you do so at whatever time the question occurs to you, because uh, what we'll do is we'll gather questions and then work them into the conversation with our panelists. Um, so please don't wait for a questions period, although we will designate time to go through some questions. But as questions occur, I encourage you to submit them through the questions pane, and we'll get to them uh, at the appropriate time. Um, finally, I just want to say that we take your feedback very seriously, 
and we try to improve every webinar. So at the end of the webinar, please take 30 seconds to complete the short evaluation that will pop up. And if it doesn't pop up or if you just prefer to send us an email uh, telling us what you thought, uh, you feel free to do that as well. We're always glad to hear from you. Uh, finally, I should say this webinar is being recorded and links to the recording, slideshows, and other re relevant materials, including the um, materials that you suggest through the questions pane, if there are materials you want to recommend to others, uh, will go to everyone who registered afterwards. You should have received uh, a, an earlier version of the slideshow uh, this morning, and uh, we'll get you materials after the fact. So don't feel like you uh, have to scribble everything down or we'll miss everything if you have to step away for a moment. Um, here's our agenda, an overview. We're going to start by um, just learning about training futures, how it works, what it does, who it serves, what the outcomes are. Then we'll talk about the partnership and, and how it's developed, how, what its origins were, and how it's continuing to grow. Finally, we'll just try to extract some principles or lessons learned about the partnership and, and what has made it so successful. So starting in just learning about training futures, I thought that it would be helpful to start with this photo that Susan Craver sent to me earlier in the week. Susan, I, I really like this photo, and I sense that there's a story behind it, although I haven't really checked with you about that. Um, I wonder, could you talk a little bit about this picture, what it is, and what, how it reflects on what Training Futures does and, and the partnership with the community college? I'd be delighted to. If you can indulge me, I'd like to tell a, a, a long ago story. Dr. Templin, uh, the president of NOVA, is pictured here, and it is his original vision that is the reason we can talk about this partnership today. A long time ago, he was a graduation speaker at our business luncheon, and he asked our proud graduates how many were planning to go on to college, and no one raised their hands. And he was so uh, confounded by that. In fact, his speech was the road to education. He kind of had to throw his speech away. Um, but he, that bothered him. And when he became president of Northern Virginia Commun Community College, he began to look for a way to innovate a partnership with Training Future. He returned to be a graduation speaker three years later and was able to announce that the graduates had already earned seven NOVA uh, credits. And it was just quite a victory and the beginning of this story. And in this particular picture, this is from just this last March, and he is congratulating Rizan Malad, who is a graduate from eight months earlier, who earned a career studies certificate in business information technology by taking three additional courses after graduating from Training Futures. So when she's telling him that she's from Training Futures, it's a huge moment. So in some ways, this moment reflects the realization of the vision that he had had um, after that moment when he asked your participants whether they were planning to go to college? Yes. OK. Well, um, you know what I'd love to do is learn uh, a little bit more about your students, students like uh, this one. And in particular, you know, here's another graduation photo, I think. Um, are, you know, are these, uh, are these recent Training Futures grads? Yes, they are. This is a picture taken at Gannett USA Today, a sponsor of this particular business luncheon. And this is just one group of graduates uh, after they've received their certificates and their transcripts from NOVA. How do these graduates more, more generally reflect the community that you serve? Is this well, a representative? Yes, it really is representative. You can see the diversity in this picture. Um, we have 25 countries in our current, represented in our current cycle of 50 trainees, and that's pretty much the way it always has been. It worked for us to vary the population in both age and uh, experiential background. 
and uh, create community. Aha. Uh -huh. I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I just uh, I know that you have some demographics about who the trainees are, and um, I just wanted to wanted to show that. Um, there, Absolutely. Uh, these don't seem like uh, traditional college students, um, if there is such a thing. That's true. They're not. Um, most of our trainees come to us with either a foreign degree and an inability to uh, use that credential in this country, or really just never had college in their sights of what was possible, either for financial reasons or just not seeing themselves as college material. What, what are some of the other challenges that, that these students uh, face? Well, we have multiple barriers to success. Uh, one is that um, just income. We, we are, our mission is that we are an outreach to the low income population of Northern Virginia. Uh, many of our trainees who refer to us come from uh, local community service agencies. And they are people who have been stuck either in um, low wage jobs with no career ladder, or they don't have job skills, and or they have uh, domestic violence or a, a lot of social ills that have held them back. Uh, uh, Bill B, B, Bill B, or Bill K, um, I want to bring bring you in here. Um, you know, from your perspective as a community college serving. Um, a, a wide geographic area in Northern Virginia and D.C. area. How, how do the challenges that these students face reflect the overall workforce challenges for the area that you serve? Well, we have in, in Northern Virginia, probably similar to many of the participants on this call that are in uh, large suburban or urban areas, we've got an increasingly diverse population. And we've got employers that really hunger for that diversity, but the folks that need those jobs, as Susan mentioned, uh, don't yet have the skills or credentials to move into those jobs. D.C. is a, a nation's knowledge center. Seventy percent of jobs require post-secondary education. So Training Futures and NOVA together can help fill that gap to get people in starter jobs and then and then move them up beyond that through continuing NOVA education into the mainstream here. And this would be okay adding one more word. Uh, many of um, training teacher students and and students in other uh, co-enrollment programs at NOVA, because there are, as, as Susan said, uh, recent immigrants, folks who never had it in their sights to attend post-secondary education, uh, they're not as comfortable with the world of online registrations and forms and multiple offices and points of contact with a large bureaucratic um, community college. And, uh, and so in many ways, the students, the, the disadvantaged students who whom we target in, in training teachers, uh, in, in, in you know not likelihood, but probably for many, uh, there's little likelihood that they would succeed in um, the community college uh, under the ordinary circumstances. That the additions of the program uh, through training teachers and through the co-enrollment uh, model uh, permit many students to uh, begin a post-secondary uh, education. That, that's really helpful um, as, as context. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that program model and, and what the Training Futures program does to help its students access opportunity and uh, address whatever challenges they might face. Do you want to talk us through uh, how it works? Yes, absolutely. First of all, let me address the first bullet, imaginal education. What that really refers to is that uh, we know that behavior 
is produced by self-image. And uh, our, our trainees traditionally come in feeling marginalized, out of the loop, and that they don't belong to the world of success. So it is our mandate to locate in, an, in a business environment that just radiates success. Our whole approach is you're a success because you're already in the environment. So it's a kind of assimilation. Right now we are in an SAIC corporate headquarters. And though we are a training program, we walk in every day with uh, the, the employees in this building, and it rubs off. So that's the basis of a lot of what we do here, which is lifting up people's self-images from not belonging to belonging and to realizing that they have a place in the world of work and they can image a successful future. Um, the training is 25 weeks. There are 650 hours, as you can see. And in our first component, which is a 17-week skill building uh, curriculum, we do most of the college credit courses. And you can see there that they're under administrative skills. Each one of these is a college course that matches the Virginia State College curriculum. And each one of them conveys three NOVA credits. And then we also have a two three courses that are one credit, they're specialized focus. One is medical terminology to allow our graduates to be eligible for medical jobs. Another one is student development. Um, we simultaneously teach college success study skills while people are earning college credit. So that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting course, but it's cer certainly required for our people to be successful. And then we teach job search skills, which uh, when the trainees return from a three-week internship, we do a five-week curriculum that includes the skills of getting and keeping a job, and also we launch job search. Woven in with that, um, in that model are adult, adult basic ed courses in math and English. Um, Toastmasters is public speaking. We know our people need to develop a voice. And Toastmasters is a great way to do that. And also, in giving these speeches and PowerPoint presentations, they get a real appreciation for each other's experiential background that they wouldn't have ordinarily had. So that's pretty much everything that we do. I did want to address the fact that we do offer a lot of support services that guarantee success, we hope, with these services in place. First of all, there is a, a highly individualized relationship with a supervisor who is a staff, full-time staff member. And that person on staff is that individual trainee's coach, mentor. The trainee meets weekly with that member of the staff. That staff member is a go-to person for any kind of problem solving. Also monitors the all-important attendance and punctuality. Um, another support service is a clothing bank. We know that part of the feeling successful is looking successful, so we address that with a clothing bank. We have a counselor come in one day a week to address any personal barriers to success. Um, we offer health access through our Northern Virginia Family Service Agency. We also have tutors, email mentors, an accent reduction dynamic, and an emergency fund. If they need it, we look at how we can provide it. Wow. Well, maybe I can ask um, Bill, uh, Bill B or Bill K, how this student experience compares to the community-based, you know, especially from your perspective, looking at students in both community-based and campus settings. How does the experience of students at Training Futures compare with the, the, the students who are enrolled in regular courses at the campus. Do they go through imaginal education too? <laughs> this is okay responding. Um, I think the answer to your question is not necessarily. Um, uh, there, from my perspective, uh, as, as director of the co-enrollment programs, uh, Training Futures and our other programs provide um, advantages and services and uh, elements of an education that that 
really aren't possible in the same way or with the same predictable effectiveness as they are with one of our um, CBO partners like Training Teachers. And we've listed some of these on this slide. Uh, the fact that there's a learning community. This is a cohort-based program. Students enter on day one and they remain together for um, six months. Uh, there are people coming in and out and uh, and through that, strong relationships are built, uh, going down to the low teachers and student ratios. Uh, when when there is this small number of students, 50 to 60 students, and they have five or six faculty, uh, they they really get to know their faculty, and their faculty get to know the students, and and that's part of the whole um, sort of supportive environment that that. Through this, the students develop more relational skills to uh, their instructors or teachers, and also with one another. And uh, and and by being built up by, as Susan described, their supervisors, their teachers, um, volunteer um, tutors, mentors, uh, the whole process leads to enormous enhancement of student self-confidence. So Susan said many come in discouraged um, at uh, their underemployment or their undereducation and at the conclusion of the program they their their sense of self and, and their capabilities is so much uh, greater. And the last bullet is um, strong relationships with employers. So the community colleges business is is basically education, even though that is changing, but when we are in a partnership with training teachers, the top goal is um, job placements and getting the students ready and, and to be successful entrants into the workforce. And so uh, through the internships and sponsorships, uh, training teachers has lots of um, established relationships and very satisfied business customers and partners. And, uh, and that, that connection to an employer community is something that, um, that students going through the traditional community college path simply don't have comparable access to. Bill, thanks for, for talking about what uh, Training Future, what Northern Virginia Family Services is able to uh, contribute to enhance the experience of students who are also enrolled at NOVA. Um, just to go back to the previous slide, I'm wondering on, on, on the flip side, Susan, it's clear that there are things that NOVA brings to the partnership for the students that they couldn't otherwise access them, uh, themselves or that they wouldn't otherwise get. Can you talk about just which parts of the program model really folks um, benefit from being affiliated with the college? Absolutely. I, I think that our partnership with uh, NOVA has introduced a rigor to our curriculum that we might not have had otherwise. Each of those courses that I mentioned, we have to present a syllabus every uh, time we teach a cycle of trainees, and it has to be you know, approved. We have curriculum evaluation done. We have uh, a lot of support in terms of what we can uh, deliver in each of these courses. And I think one of the things that helps the most is dedicated counselors that come on site to help each person map a post-training futures direction. We also are, are just about to administer the uh, English placement test here at Training Futures. And we've had a counselor on site to help coach our trainees with test taking skills. Uh, so there's just a lot of resources that are available as students of NOVA. There are student services on campuses that they can avail themselves of, of such as tutoring, the bookstores. It's, it's really delivered a wonderful set of support. So the counselors you were just referencing, those are uh, college counselors employed by NOVA, but who spend part of their time on site at your location? Exactly. All right. 
And I suppose the students also benefit. You mentioned the credits that they receive by participating in, in your training at your location. And also, um, I suppose, through the connection more generally with the college? Yes, I think that, um, as I said, the academic rigor that we've introduced, mm -hmm. I think our, our trainees realize that they can learn as a college student, that they do have what it takes, no matter what messages they had in the past, they are succeeding in 18 college credits in a one semester span. They know they can do the work now, and they're motivated to continue. I think they have a huge, a much bigger vision of their future with NOVA, with the credits already launching their academic career. And uh, it's just very exciting to see their vision expand because of that. Well, I, I want to talk about outcomes of this in a moment, um, including those kinds of downstream outcomes where participants continue in college. Um, but first, I want to say to those who have sent questions already, thank you. We will get to some of those questions, so we'll work them in. And I would encourage you, as you're uh, out, as you're listening, if you have questions, to continue to send those. Um, and then I know that one of the areas that people really wanted to understand about the partnership, well, actually, I, I will back up. One of the questions um, that I just want to be clear about is um, uh, just the types of organizations that are involved. Um, the question, one of the questions, and thanks, Colleen LaRose, was, is Training Futures part of the public workforce system? Um, and this sounds like um, what many of the one-stop uh, career centers do across the country um, with connections to the college. I, can you describe just your institutional setting and um, how it uh, either complements or, uh, or replicates what's available in the, in the one-stop system? Well, yes, I can. Um, we do get referrals from the one-stop uh, locations in Northern Virginia. Uh, this present cycle, we don't have any uh, ITAs, but we have had them in the past. Um, we are looking to expand our relationship. At the moment in Northern Virginia, the focus is on delivering a credential, a certificate, at the end of a training. And we do not have a NOVA certificate yet a career study certificate, mm -hmm. but we are working in that direction. Mm -hmm. It also sounds like the range of services that you provide, uh, particularly the range of support services and, and, and wraparound services, as well as customized training, is more intensive than what folks would necessarily get through uh, the one-stop system. Is, is that fair? Absolutely. Absolutely fair to say. So they could be partners in terms of uh, referral partners uh, for you as well? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks for that question. Um, go ahead. Uh, this is okay, just offering another piece of clarification. Um, Training Futures is a program of Northern Virginia Family Service, and, and that's a, a, a private organization. It's not part of the, the public system in Northern Virginia, although there are programs that NDS operates that do receive grant funding, but, but they're not um, in any uh, organizational, direct organizational line to any, any, any uh, entity within the public workforce sector. That's a helpful clarification. Thanks. Um, so, we, in, in the registration, there were quite a few questions about the financial model and, and me methods for financial partnering. So I thought it would be helpful to learn more about the business model that underlies uh, Training Futures. Um, can, can you just talk about how this partnership works financially? Sure. This is, this is Bill Beattie. I'll take a shot at that. Those of you out there we're with CBOs will really like this because our <coughs> significant revenue stream for Training Futures as a nonprofit 
those of you at colleges may scratch your head and wonder if it's legal to write such large checks to outside entities. And not only is it legal, but it makes business sense for the college. So I'll walk you through it. But um, the, a real key to this is access to Pell Grant. Uh, when you're going to a job training program at a nonprofit, you don't have access to federal financial aid, which is only to accredited higher ed institutions like NOVA and other colleges. And Pell Grants are um, they're an entitlement. And a lot of adults out there think that they're not eligible because they're older or they're part-time students, which is a real myth. So what we do when people are admitted to Training Futures, they then um, complete a NOVA application and the FAFSA, the Federal Financial Aid application, in a proctored setting. And we accelerate a review of those FAFSA applications prior to starting Training Futures in a way that um, around 80% of Training Futures participants do receive financial aid. And I'm not talking about loans, which we discouraged. I'm talking about uh, Pell Grant and some institutional financial aid. So our business model is dependent on uh, largely on Pell Grant to fund the cost for those 18 college credits that people can earn. So uh, the way we do this is a lot like colleges around America do dual enrollment with high school. We borrowed the contract that we have um, and the whole model around dual enrollment. So uh, that's the, the business model that it's based on. We contract, NOVA contracts with Northern Virginia Family Service for um, the space and for handling payroll for adjuncts who are qualified adjuncts for NOVA. We're going to hit that process in just a minute, but we do qualify training futures instructors on their payroll as adjuncts for NOVA, and the curriculum is aligned with ours. So we contract with Northern Virginia Family Service. They're providing the instruction uh, or the payroll of our, our adjuncts and the space. So we pay a base rate of 80% of the tuition that we receive from each cohort back to Training Futures. And I believe that that funding stream, which is a renewable funding stream, doesn't go away, is Training Futures' second largest funding stream. Training Futures, like most nonprofits, has to pack together funding from all kinds of resources. And NOVA is now a second largest funding stream. So it makes sense for NOVA as well. We did an ROI analysis a couple years ago. And of the $130,000 in total tuition collected at NOVA, we had direct cost of our payments to Training Futures, a couple of adjuncts on our payroll who handled medical terminology in some of the courses that our staff delivered, plus the cost of administrative staff for handling all those FAFSAs and other stuff on site. And NOVA generated about a $20,000 surplus from Training Futures. That goes back into paying for the operation that it takes to really keep running these programs. And then finally, we do have counselors here on site, and that's partly self-funding. We did an experiment a few years ago, and when we bring, before we brought counselors here, only about 20% of training future students came back to NOVA after they finished to keep going at, at NOVA or work on a degree. And after we brought counselors here, about 50% came back. And we put a number on that of about $16,000 in new tuition that we realized from those counseling services. So it's not just a cost. There is a revenue associated with it. So it's a, it's a great revenue stream for Northern Virginia Family Service Training Futures. And it's actually a positive and a good business arrangement for NOVA as well. Wow. So I, I, as someone who came from a community-based organization myself, I, I hear about an arrangement like this, and I both think, wow, that's, that makes sense. And also, boy, we, I wish we'd had uh, that funding stream. That funding then helps to pay for all of the other range of services, Susan, that, that you described a moment ago? Yes, it certainly does. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Bill, does uh, does getting those extra uh, credit hours also allow NOVA to pull down state FTE dollars? Is there uh, another revenue stream that it enables for for NOVA? Yeah, yeah it does. And in fact, that $20,000 surplus that we realized a couple of years ago did not include the FTE dollars that would, will flow in later. So that's sort of a bonus on top of that. All right, all right. 
and it's not um, a small bonus. That could exceed the twenty thousand um, dollars when when the state apportionment is made based on FTEs. Okay, I I, uh, I suspect we may get some more questions about that. Please do send questions if you have them. Um, I want to uh, just talk a little bit about the the partner roles, and we've already talked uh, through some of these, but you know maybe um, if you're able each to talk about what the, what your partner contributes that that uh, that you might not otherwise be able to, or if there's anything in particular that hasn't been mentioned that you'd like to add, um, this would be a great a great moment. Yeah, on the Nova side, this is Bill B. On the Nova side, I think we've mentioned a lot of it. Um, uh, we do provide some oversight on, on the curriculum. It's our responsibility. These are state uh, college courses that are, happen to be delivered at uh, Training Futures site. The other piece that we haven't talked about is we have an ESL bridge course that we have. Training Futures turns away two applicants for every one that's admitted because their English isn't quite there. So. We've identified folks who are near misses in being admitted to training teachers because of their English. And we have a NOVA course on site. Instead of sending them away, we have a NOVA course that we can offer them on site here that prepares them to get ready for the next cohort and to build their English skills. So that's one that we haven't mentioned. That's, that's I think great. It's and, um, go I ahead. just wanted to add uh, that um, it's important to look at these partner roles that you know it's representing the marriage of workforce development and a community college. So these, uh, the fact is that Training Futures is responsible for finding the trainees. We have tremendous um, outreach over our 16-year history into the community. And uh, we have about 200 referral agencies that we send our intake information to. The other source of our uh, trainees is word of mouth. We really don't advertise because I think we'd be flooded. Um, I think it's important to also say that our trainees don't, the only thing they put into the mix from their own personal finances is they pay a $350 book fee. But that is it as far as what it costs a trainee since they are all low income. Um, and of course, we said we're at SAIC. That's the important factor in having that, that uh, skill set that says I'm ready for an office job in a corporate or business environment. And if I, this is Bill B. If I could just add in on the training recruitment piece, I, I talked to a lot of colleges out there who have a sense that they're almost in competition for students with local nonprofit job training programs. And I just want to affirm that the folks that come to Training Futures and our other CBO partners, these are not people that are showing up on our campus. Uh, and we are not likely to attract them, and we're not likely to keep them. We actually did a study, and only, I believe, 8% of Training Futures incoming trainees in the period of this study, and these are people who are 30 years old or more, um, had ever gone to NOVA. So we are not competing with students. Uh, they're bringing a whole new section of students that we do not attract or serve well. I'm really glad you mentioned that. I, I mean, it strikes me that these roles are are very complementary, and that they help to fill in um, uh, gaps uh, that each partner might otherwise experience. Is that how you see things? And 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 are you each <laughs> able to acknowledge the things that maybe the other can do better? Absolutely. Yeah. Feel like a marriage. We love each other. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I also. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, I just want to say I also really like this this uh, quote that you have uh, added, Susan, um, at the bottom here, and it really uh, sort of reflects some of the uh, almost intangibles that you sort of mentioned at the start about the. Um, the experience of participating in training futures and imagining a, a, a greater future. So I don't know if you need to comment on it. I just wanted to say I really like it. Thank you. I do want to comment on it. I think it's really an important part of our methodology 
that we, uh, we, we, we don't listen to people's self-talk when they come in and they, they don't feel capable. We just um, plunge them into the environment of an academic setting as well as a work skills setting. And we see that within about two weeks, they've got the confidence that, yes, I am a college student. They've taken on the mantle. Yes, I am someone who can hold their own in a professional environment. So we, we love it. And our clothing bank, of course, is very important because they, they start feeling like a professional when they start looking like a professional as well. But I think it's the, um, it's the book bag that's the symbol of the college students. They carry their textbooks everywhere they go. So yeah, from this moment on, you know, no matter how you feel, you will feel okay. Just stay with it. I'll, I'll say I, I also I'm glad you mentioned the clothing bank because, and as we'll see in future photos, I'm just blown away by how well dressed your students are, and um, it had me feeling like maybe I could use a clothing bank myself. <laughs> we all feel like that. <laughs> well, let's let's move on and talk a little bit about outcomes, um, and uh, you know these are are, are impressive. Uh, numbers. Do you want to do you want to talk us through, Susan, just how students who participate in the program do and what happens to them next? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, these are definitely our results, and um, we we have a, a a very good retention rate because again we are we are very motivational with our curriculum. The other thing that Novus uh, contributed is. Um, People are invested in getting those college credits, and they cannot drop out of those courses. So there are a lot of reasons to stay with Training Futures. Currently, in our in our current cycle, we're in our 11th week, and no one we haven't lost anyone. We have 100% retention at this point. Within six months of graduating, even in a recession, and it has been hard uh, to place people. We have to work about four times harder. We do have a good percentage, 84%. Our current graduation cycle uh, is three months out, and we have a 65% placement uh, just three months from graduation, and one-third of those jobs came from internships. I want to update the hourly wage. It is harder to find jobs these days, but they're paying more, we're discovering. And we now have a 62% increase from prior wages. And our average uh, salary is $14.46. Um, so that, that is, uh, that, those are our current statistics. I also want to clarify that uh, a number of our trainees do not work. They're either on unemployment, they're on TANF and VIEW. Um, but we do calculate the, the minimum wage for them. So the increase goes from seven fifty an hour up to whatever they earn when they're placed on a job. Hmm. And um, yes, yeah, so, so I think the rest is pretty much uh, self-explanatory. I do see a duplication. Maybe I should ask, um, from the college's perspective, is, is NOVA sort of equally interested in these outcomes? Are there other outcomes that, uh, or are there some subset of these that particularly matter, matter to the college? Um, We've actually, uh, both organizations have had to change their view of their normal outcomes in some way. So the college, which doesn't normally track things like employment and wage gains as carefully as a nonprofit job training program, We've had to co-own those outcomes along with Training Futures. And Training Futures has been asked to co-own with us the outcome of people earning college credit and continuing on at college. So both organizations have had to change their perspective and enlarge their view of outcomes on either side of the partnership. All right, that's, that's quite helpful. I want to take uh, a few questions, um, and there are some sort of nuts and bolts questions um, that have come through. Um, Oswaldo Alvarez has asked, who is responsible for job placement and employer outreach? Susan. <laughs> that would be Training Futures. Yes. We Susan, have, uh, Susan, you personally? Uh, well, no, thank goodness. 
we are all job developers at Training Futures because that's what it really takes to place our people. Um, and we have in-house job fairs, and of course we work with internship providers uh, so that uh, we, we can have, we, we actually prioritize internship orders that we get from our employer community based on who has a position that that intern could move into. The internship is free, um, but that employer will have someone who has absorbed the company culture, has already uh, learned how to be an employee as an intern. So that's why we, we really appreciate uh, that part of our job development outreach. Can I, may, may I add, NOVA participates as an employer of Training Futures graduates. We host interns at NOVA. We generally might hire a couple of graduates each, each year for jobs there. And then some who want to continue on for the college have leveraged work-study positions at the college that support them with a, with a job on campus while they continue their study. So NOVA is an employer contributor. And, and NOVA is increasingly interested in that. I'm sure um, you and, and many of the folks on the line recognize that this is a pretty unusual program. And, um, and well, we feel that too. With, with the college, we, we don't fit into a lot of traditional boxes. And, um, and since all of the instruction is at the site of the, of a partner, or we can be almost invisible, uh, but, but we're gaining that visibility. And, and even um, since the fall, I've had two different offices at the college contact me or, or my office and say, hey, are there any training teachers um, graduates that, that would be good for this position that I'm, I'm going to be posting? So um, the college really tries to, to play its role in that. That, that's really helpful. Um, I like the mention about the internships, and there were uh, some questions that we received about the internships themselves. Um, Lauren Green and Matt Weiss ask if they are paid or unpaid, and if they're subsidized or unsubsidized. Um, could you, you know, briefly just talk about uh, the internships and, and whether participants earn from them or just learn from them? Well, it is uh, most of the time learn versus earn. Um, mm -hmm. that, but we do have a small percentage of internship providers who, because of legal reasons, will pay an intern a, a about a $10 an hour wage uh, for insurance or company policy reasons. But it's more the exception than the norm. What our trainees gain from the internship is their internship supervisor becomes a job reference. And their internship job becomes the first job they list on their resume. So that with the training futures workplace simulation gives them a credential of really being workplace savvy. And it's, it's, they have a letter of reference as well that's part of their toolkit for job search from that internship provider. So it gives them a lot of benefit. OK, I think that, that answers the, the question. Um, there are a number of questions about who qualifies for training futures. And I just wonder if um, there are any criteria for participation that haven't been mentioned. Um, in particular, whether there are certain uh, populations um, with multiple barriers, such as people with disabilities or people with prior convictions who have participated and benefited from the program? Absolutely. Uh, we have a number of people with disabilities um, who come uh, to Training Futures. Again, our individualized setting is perfect for them. They have to be, with Training Futures added, employable, and that would be our criterion during the intake process. We do not turn people away for conviction. Um, we do know the employers who would not be able to hire them because of a record. But again, we see that as part of our outreach. Um, we turn very few people away, except that we do have to be realistic about their ability to do college-level work. And that has raised uh, the four that, that we look at from the TABE test 
from a sixth grade level to a seventh grade level. We also have our, uh, our incoming candidates write three short essays because we need to assess their English writing skill as well. Um, we are looking for people who can uh, financially make it. We don't want to put anyone into economic hard times. And, and we also look at people who can support a long commute and um, adding 27, week, 27 hours a week at Training Future to their job and family responsibilities. So um, we did have questions particularly about placement tests. Um, <laughs> you're saying that the, as far as placement tests, you use TABE, the test of adult basic education, uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, an essay requirement, and you, you make your decisions based on that. Is there any kind of acuplacer or um, uh, a college um, placement test that's required? The, uh, yeah, what we've been able to do is leverage NOVA's, some flexibility in NOVA's policy. Generally, when people come to NOVA, that's the first thing you do is take a placement test. We learned very early on that that is not a strategy that works with this audience. We, the first cohort that we offered for co-enrollment, we did it at the very beginning, the college placement test. The results were miserable, and the damage done was discernible. So we, uh, NOVA does allow us to administer the placement test sometime prior to the second semester. So we pushed that back by about three, three months into the cohort, and we found that the placement test results on, on our NOVA's acuplacer test, which is mostly what we use for this audience, went up by three to four times when we just delayed that test by three months, when they're much more confident, they know how to press buttons on a computer, and they know how to take tests. Got it. And, and those that uh, uh, don't qualify for whatever reason, what happens to those who aren't yet ready for, for the rigors of training, training future? We, training we actually do, we do an assessment on each candidate, and we tell them exactly what they need to address to be qualified to come into a future cycle. And as Phil has mentioned, if it is ESL that they need to get to a higher level, then we do have this bridge program that's been very successful. And because it's on site at Training Futures, the people in that ESL program really do accelerate their TABE scores um, because they already feel like they belong to the program. And um, it's just been a wonderful innovation. Um, I have a couple of uh, a couple of questions here um, about uh, the college and some of its uh, constraints. One is just about what the Pell Grant actually pays for. Um, can can you comment on on what the Pell Grant pays for? Sure. Um, the Pell Grant uh, is is a fixed amount um, based on income level and based upon number of credits um, undertaken in a given semester. And so um, if students are, are receive a maximum Pell Grant, they can receive a maximum Pell Grant for any number of credits above 12. And the way our terms work in six months, they're generally eligible um, to apply for more than one term, one semester's award. Um, you know, the 16-week semester um, has its eligibility. So they can, they can get uh, Pell Grants over two semesters. Um, if 12 hours is the, the minimum that's required for a full award, students will still get the full award. And so if a student has a full award and they may be taking 12 credits, they're actually going to get a, they're going to get a refund check. Um, from the mm -hmm. Department of Education or from NOVA. I'm not really sure actually who issues those. Um, that, that is the difference between the tuition for those 12 credits and the amount of the award. And, and for many students, that, that refund check permits them to buy texts or to um, help with their transportation. It's really not highly regulated. Um, there's great latitude on what what can be what those refund checks can be used for. And just to follow the dollars, 
the, the Pell Grant amount goes to the college, which is an institution that's qualified to receive that, but then that the, the college um, cuts a check for the services that are provided by Northern Virginia Family Services. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And those, are, those are two very different accounting transactions. It isn't it's like it's coming in one bucket and going out of the same bucket. The Pell dollars are attached to the student's account and pay for the college credits that they're enrolled in here at Training Futures. And then from a whole different accounting uh, mechanism, we compensate Training Futures after the cohort is completed. Understood. Okay. Um, I'll ask one last question that's a kind of nuts and bolts, and, and the questions have been streaming in, so um, thank you for sending them. But um, I just want to ask one. Um, there's a question about the status of the adjunct faculty, and um, you know, and the question is, is there a faculty union at NOVA, and are the Training Futures faculty part of that union if there is one? Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, related to their adjunct faculty status. Uh, there is, is no union um, of faculty. Uh, the, the faculty come to Training Futures in, in one of two ways. Uh, they are individuals who are on the Training Futures staff prior to our co-enrollment partnership, and um, we evaluate their credentials just as we would any other um, individual who is applying to be an adjunct faculty at NOVA. So they submit transcripts and record of academic accomplishments. That's the, the core of it. And their, um, their qualifications have to meet the standard. And you know that ha sometimes they haven't met the standard. And we've really struggled with that. We, we know that there are really good trainers um, who have lots of experience but um, they can't teach for the college, unfortunately, if they don't have um, the right degree or the right number of credit hours. Uh, so that's, that's the one method is where the, the um, adjunct was previously a part of the team at Training Teachers. Um, they submit their credentials, and we get them approved as adjuncts based on the same standard that would apply to any other individual. The second method is where, on occasion, um, there isn't someone on the Training Future staff, and, um, but they need the program component. So in those cases, NOVA will, will search and, and will go to our list of adjunct faculty who aren't um, fully scheduled in a given term, and, and we will provide that instructor um, in those cases we pay them from NOVA, and, and we subtract that amount of payment from the, the reimbursement we give to training futures for space and instruction. And, and a couple of examples of that are the, the course in medical terminology that is part of the curriculum. We have someone from our medical campus come over to do that course. And we also have the course that we mentioned in um, college success skills. Um, that has to be taught by an individual with a master's degree in counseling. And uh, so one of our NOVA counselors will come in to teach that course. Well, I, 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 that, that's very helpful for understanding the status of, of those instructors. So I want to turn now to the origins of the partnership. And it, we just received a question about this, which was, how did this partnership originally form? Did NOVA and NOVA stands for Northern Virginia, I guess, uh, the Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, did NOVA approach Training Futures or vice versa? Susan, you talked a little bit about that uh, first appearance of uh, Dr. Templin at a, at a graduation before he was president of the college, um, revealing uh, the need to connect folks better with, with, uh, with college. Um, what happened next? How did, how, how did the uh, partnership develop? And I just, you know, who, who approached whom? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually an interesting story. Um, <laughs> Dr. Templin was well known here, but he was not Nova's president, but he knew Nova's president well. So he brokered a meeting after that graduation where people raised their, didn't raise their hands about interest in college. 
He brokered a meeting with NDFS's leadership and the president of NOVA, where he said, hey, you guys need to be working together um, more closely, training futures in NOVA. And the president at NOVA pulled by Dr. Templin aside at the end of the meeting. He said, I'm real interested. I'd like to help, but I've just been appointed secretary of education for the state of Virginia. And so I'm leaving the college. And then Dr. Templin said, well, <laughs> that's interesting. Long story short, uh, nine months later, he's the, the president of Northern Virginia Community College. And, um, and we start the process of bringing our organizations together. Bill Kay mentioned the marriage, which is what we're at now, but we actually dated at first. <laughs> um, it started as a transfer credit partnership with just seven credits in 2003, where a faculty committee reviewed Training Futures curriculum and um, aligned it with seven credits that students that completed Training Futures could enter NOVA and claim those transfer credits. We didn't add the co-enrollment model until a little bit later on, for those of you out there at the front end of partnerships, when they work well together, you learn about each other and you learn how, that, how you can work even more closely together with greater benefit for both organizations and the people you mutually serve. So we didn't figure that out for three years into the partnership. And then we've added the other features that you see on your slide since then, Jim. Well, I love that analogy that you that you dated first, but the relationship deepened, and you um, learned that uh, you could be uh, a happy marriage, um, and you could accomplish more that way. I, I think that's a fascinating way of looking at it. It actually breaks down a little bit, Jim, when you talk about the next slide, because NOVA is, is not a monogamous when it comes to CBO partnership. We've replicated this <laughs> elsewhere. My colleagues can talk more about it. I would also like to say before we get into that, that uh, just like in a dating uh, engagement kind of thing, we had to convince the Nova family that we were marriage material. And it mm -hmm. was one thing to have a vision, and it was another thing to have a buy-in of the, the registrar and the student services and the provost and all of the people that were responsible for having this work on the, in the college. So we spent some time during this partnership of growing relationships between uh, Training Futures and NOVA. It was really important to do that. And this is the way we get to the slide on the growth, growth strategy. Um, we are really very fortunate that um, our first uh, trial at this was so successful. Um, we, we regard the NOVA Training Futures Partnership as, as a huge success, and um, and some of those early we can call them battles, right? <laughs> that were that were won um, for the sake of both of us have permitted us to enter into other partnerships with greater ease, um, less time. Uh, we, we know what we, what we need to do, and so you see from the slide that we presently have um, six other partners. Uh, uh, seven programs in all. Uh, they serve about 800 students per year, and there are now five um, people on the staff. I have four other staff who work with me. Um, so that's that's one of our growth strategies: is to spread the model into different sectors and among different organizations. And and, and I'll you know hold that comment because the next slide will address that. Um, Another initiative that, that we started, um, again, probably very much related to the fact that um, continuation rates um, at NOVA, students who graduated and went on, they, they weren't very high, as we've described. And so we have a program now that's about 18 months old um, called Adult Career Pathways, where uh, our, our, these are career counselors, again, who come on site and get to know the students here and, and present them with the opportunities for their continued study and seek to build on the enhanced self-esteem, on the momentum that the students have, have um, gathered by, by being in the program, having had success, um, and anticipating additional success. And, so these counselors work with the students to identify um, a post-training futures um, path. If, if training futures gets them their first um, decently paying job, 
well, what will the next step be? You know, how can you get on onto a career ladder in um, this industry where you have begun, or in the course of these six months, uh, have you discovered that there's another industry that you're interested in that is not office administration or not medical records keeping? And those counselors help the students to identify goals, to be, be very honest about their abilities, about the time it would take to accomplish um, different goals, and, and to then help them enter those paths, to keep them on track, to help them with enrollment um, challenges, uh, and to help them to avoid distraction. Uh, you know, when they move out of the, I would call it the sheltered environment of training futures and onto the campus, it's just a, a, a big world. And um, your friend says, oh, I've got this great course, you know, I just found this one social studies course to be so cool. And, you know, if, if that social studies course isn't a part of your IT, um, your next IT degree, then you probably don't want to invest your time and money in that um, if, if, if the career remains your goal. So the, the Velker Pathways program uh, has greatly increased the number of um, training teacher students who have continued. Um, uh, they, they complete training features, they get their job situation stable, and then they're enrolling back at NOVA to continue toward the next goal. We also have a relationship with uh, Forge this year um, with the nonprofit roundtable. There's a Northern Virginia uh, subgroup, and um, we have enlisted them to, to spread the word and to um, get the word to 100 nonprofit organizations in Northern Virginia that are among the higher capacity organizations. Um, just what we do, what CBO, what community-based co-enrollment programs are about, um, how adult career pathways could assist their clients. And so through this um, added outreach, we've been able to um, connect with a lot of additional referral partners to both of our programs, and we're in conversation both the Adult Career Pathways program and the Community-Based Co-Enrollment program um, to see if we have new partners who would be interested in developing independent independent programs like these, if you just switch the, side, the slide, these are our current ones. You see each one has a niche. So the Hopkins Health Program does early childhood education. Um, Computer Core is similar to Training Futures, but, but not, as, not as rigorous. The time commitment is much lower, and um, they often start with students who are at a lower skill level. Um, uh, we have um, training futures that we've listed. Um, Year Up is a program for younger adults, ages 18 to 24, many who sort of fell through the cracks through high school and have landed in early adulthood, underemployed and uncertain where to go. And they specialize in, in IT. Um, another, you see entrepreneurship. Um, Goodwill of Greater Washington is our newest partner. We, we partner with them to prepare individuals who receive licensure to be on our security guards in the state of Virginia. One of the things that strikes me, and, and particularly I think it's represented in this quote at the bottom of the, of the growth strategy slide, is that this is not actually incidental to uh, the college's overall strategy. This growth strategy seems like it's not just about uh, the growth of, of a training futures or or, a, or something that is an add-on, but in some ways it seems like this is central strategically for the college and in, 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 in how it sees fulfilling its role as a community. Is that is that a right assumption or, or a good meeting of, of this? Yeah, they, uh, this is still be our um, strategic vision document. Um, claims this for NOVA, that we're the gateway to the American dream. We're where the needs of employers and the community um, intersect. So before we embarked on this kind of strategy, Jim, we sort of asked the community to come to the college. And now we're taking the college out to the community in all these ways that you see on this slide in pursuit of this mission, really, to, to create these pathways to the American dream by partnering with terrific organizations like Training Futures and employers that 
want to um, want to realize the benefits of the kind of diverse um, population that is uh, uh, in our training program. Well, thank you for the uh, for that. It's just uh, you know one of the things that we have heard at NNSP is about what's essential for um, successful partnering is an alignment of, of vision, and it's clear that reaching the community that uh, Training Futures cares about and and uh, including them in the college and the uh, and the success that includes um, both completion of training but also ongoing education is, is important to both parties. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that you all have done in, in mapping out the process of developing this co-enrollment process. Um, we could probably spend an entire webinar talking about this process and I don't think we have we don't have time for that. But um, maybe Bill K, do you want to do you want to pick out a few highlights of this? I know you've talked about the credentials review. Um, Maybe you can walk us through it uh, briefly. I passed this one to Bill B. after <laughs> we talked last. <laughs> so I'll go just real quickly hit on some things that we haven't hit on. So those of you that are looking at this kind of partnership, if you are uh, trying to create an alignment between an existing job training program and a college, this might take six months at the quickest to, to run through this. If you're creating a brand new program, it could be a year plus. So that's just a, a length of time, but we talked about the alignment of interest. It really has to be, you've got to have executive sponsorship at both the college and at the nonprofit organization from the very beginning. The nonprofit organization has to see, leaders have to see the benefit of the college because we're going to induce some pain and suffering uh, with our nonprofit partners just because of the administrative processes involved. And then the college has to recognize that we can't do and be all things, and that nonprofits add some great value and bring a great audience to us. So there's got to be that alignment from the very beginning. So we talked a little bit about the faculty credentialing and the curriculum review process and the business agreement already. Um, real, real briefly, we haven't hit on the project plan. One of our success factors in integrating our services together is to jointly plan how we work together, um, each cohort. So we've got developed a project management discipline. We actually have a project plan template that has about 25 action steps that we have to execute jointly in really tight sequencing over the course of the cohort. And in those 25 steps, those of you at a college can understand this, it cuts across six functional areas at a college who don't normally like to talk to each other. <laughs> and those functional, six functional areas have four different regulatory oversight authorities that tell them what they can and cannot do. So navigating the regulation on the credit side of the house is difficult to do, but we've mapped it out in this project planning process. And woe be it to the uh, partner that's trying to do this without a, a really carefully thought out plan. And we go back to this planning. We do it. We do it with every every cohort. Uh, so we do it. We do it twice a year. Um, it's not a, a quick process. It takes a couple of hours minimum, and we're usually scrambling at the end of that time. Even though we know each other so well and we know so much about the program and each other's roles, it still takes a couple of hours, and we, we barely um, we barely make it. It's basically the deliverable in the partnership, who does what when. And that's why it has to be done for each cohort. And you know, one of the things on our project tool is uh, come to Training Futures and administer the English placement test. And then come back to Training Futures and help interpret the results and see that's all timelined out over the um, calendar of the cycle or training group. And I'm sure with uh, 11 or more cycles under your belt, you've gotten good at anticipating the kinds of things that, that will come up and, uh, and, and, and noting every last T that needs to be crossed and I that, uh, that uh, needs to be dotted. That's true. I want to let folks who are listening know, I will, uh, these slides will be sent to you. Um, I, we had some questions about whether or not um, uh, people would get the slides, and I can imagine a great deal of interest in this particular slide. Uh, after the webinar, 
uh, all, all the slideshows will be sent to you as well as uh, underlying um, or supporting materials and a recording, a link to the recording of the session. So just to reassure you, you don't have to copy this slide down now, right now. Um, also, I did get a question about how the course qualifies for Pell Grants, and I'm wondering if that figures into this process at all, perhaps in the curriculum approval section. Uh, how is it that, at, at what point does um, Pell Grant uh, approval come in? Right. That, that is exactly right. Um, this is um, our steps two, three, and four in this, in this model. You know, the, so the, the, the training teachers had a program before the re a relationship with NOVA. And in, in establishing the relationship, um, we, we looked very seriously at all elements of the curriculum. We, just, just, we, we recognized those components that were absolutely um, identical with courses that any student could take on a NOVA campus. We identified other components that were kind of close. And with some tweaking, they could be turned into um, regular NOVA courses. We recognize some that, you know what, there, there isn't anything um, that, that NOVA does that's just the same as this, um, but it's important to the program. And so students aren't going to get credit for this, even though it's part of the program. So we, that we call aligning the curriculum. Uh, and then the second part is the faculty review that we discussed. These are NOVA faculty. They have all the same privileges, they can get any faculty discounts, they get faculty parking permits, and all of the stuff that adjunct faculty would receive from the college. Um, and so that's what permits the co-enrollment. Uh, because they are um, uh, receiving college courses for which they're going to get credit, because the courses are instructed by NOVA adjunct faculty, they're in college. You know, they, they complete their application online. These courses, the training teachers, have course numbers that they're registered into. And, and the only difference is it's, it's on site. It's at this remote location, but it's the same thing. It's NOVA courses taught by NOVA instructors. That permits us to enroll them as NOVA students. And at that point, they're co-enrolled with NOVA and training teachers. And because of the co-enrollment, because they have become NOVA students and not just training future students, they can apply for um, Pell Grants as community college students. OK. Um, you know, th thanks for that. I want to uh, move on. Um, hold on a second. I need to be able to move my slides. Let's see. So there we go. Um, we have just a few minutes left, and I want to make sure to um, extract a few of the lessons that uh, you've learned. Um, so um, thank you for the questions. Uh, we, we may still have a few minutes for questions, but before we do that, I just want to pull out a few uh, of, the que of the lessons that you've learned through this experience of, of dating and marriage and, and, uh, and, and living together now for some years. Um, these are some of the principles for success, uh, successful partnerships that NNSP has observed over the years and that sector initiatives have told us are important. Um, and I think in our conversation, we've really hit on quite a number of them. But I'm just wondering, uh, from your experience, are any of these particularly true for your partnership? Are there some that stand out? Sure. Uh, they're all true. Uh, ones that I would highlight are the third bullet. Everybody has an interest and everybody has to benefit. This is not um, NOVA doing community service. Um, this is NOVA having a business reason and an educational reason for engaging in this partnership. Um, the formalized agreements are absolutely critical. There's a lot of money involved. There are a lot of regulations, as Bill said, you know, for regulatory uh, entities involved uh, in, in just at NOVA. And so the formalized agreements are, are awfully important. Um, as, as, we, as also Bill described, uh, build that partnership into the bone. It can take six months if you're pretty well established, a year if you're not. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And I, there are just a couple more that I want to emphasize there. 
Um, I think this is, is so important that um, any, any institutions intending to do a partnership like this really need to do the research up front. You, you have to know who you want to serve and you have to know um, what your labor market is. Are, are there jobs there? Are there employers that are interested in this? Um, you have to begin early to develop those relationships with business to understand what they're looking for, if they have any interest in your program, how you could um, take their interest in consideration to build a program that is even more interesting to them. Um, engaging your community as broadly as possible. You're going to receive, um, as we mentioned, um, nonprofits, uh, referrals, um, support. As, as, as Susan said, only we're the second largest source of income. Uh, so you're going to need many other sources. So uh, build your, your support community broadly. Um, another one is, is uh, don't bite off more than you can chew. As Bill said, the first program was just a few credits for transfer. It enlarged. It grew. We've changed the course here and there. So it, it, just, it just grows. Um, know that niche. I pointed out the seven programs. Each of them has a slightly different niche. They have clear outcome goals. And the last is to, to just really keep, keep good records of what you're doing. Um, trust your data. Uh, if your data disconfirms some part of your idea or your wish, trust your data. <laughs> you know, um, allow that your wish can be modified. Trust your data. Jim, I'd like to see if we could flash on the two pictures. Um, the one, the banner picture of the uh, nine people that in slide 20, and then the one on 24. That's the, the second one. These are pictures of marriage ceremonies. Um, this one is the is the graduation at Nova. All of the people pictured here in eight months after graduating from Training Futures. Uh, qualified to receive a NOVA Career Studies Certificate in Business Information Technology. Each one of these people took a minimum of nine additional credits on a campus to qualify to walk the stage at NOVA. Uh, and they did that in eight months. The previous picture was the graduation uh, from the graduation, there you go, the, the business luncheon at the end of Training Futures. And this represents a marriage ceremony. These are all graduates. And they received both a certificate of workforce development and administrative uh, skills from Training Futures. And they received a transcript from NOVA at this graduation. I can't imagine a better marriage. I think that's, that's really. Um, that, that is a, wonder, a wonderful sentiment. I really like this analogy. <laughs> I think we're going to be using it for a, for a while now. Um, was there anything um, else, Susan, as a 501c3 um, partnering with the community college um, as far as sort of lessons learned for making this a happy marriage um, that, that you would want to highlight? Um. <laughs> patience <laughs> and the bureaucratic uh, systems at NOVA are sometimes confounding to us, but mm -hmm. we get interpreters to help us with them and um, the CBO office is, they are our allies. Without them, I, I tell you, I don't know how we do it, but that's, that's tremendous to have that advocacy on campus. And I would say build relationships. Go to every one of those functions that is interfaced with you and get to know the people personally and get to inspire them, motivate them, invite them to graduation, give them a sense that they are making a huge contribution to people's lives so that they have a buy-in when they have an increased administrative load because of your, part your partnership. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, I'm, I, I want to thank you for sharing so much uh, about your partnership and being really candid about it as well. And uh, we won't be able to get to everyone's questions. There's still a lot of questions left, so I'll do my best to uh, follow up with folks whose questions weren't answered. I want to encourage you to 
before you leave the webinar to complete this very, very brief evaluation. It should take 30 seconds or less. And um, please feel free also to get in touch with me if you have uh, further questions or uh, suggestions for other topics that you'd like to see covered in other webinars or uh, panelists whose work you'd really like to hear about. But um, Susan, Bill, Kay, and Bill B, I really, really appreciate uh, your speaking with us today and sharing your wonderful experience and the, the example of Training Futures, which is, which is uh, so remarkable. Thank you. It, uh, we, uh, we really love the opportunity. We're very proud um, of, of what we've accomplished, and we, we love to share it, and um, we love to tell the story. Well, and justifiably so, it's, it's a great story. So for those on the line, uh, thank you also for participating today. Um, we want these to be useful to you. We hope this has been, and we look forward to your participating in future webinars and events of the National Network of Sector Partners. So until next time, be well, and uh, take care. All the best. Thank you.